Shareable is part of C-Suite Radio. I'm going to go out on a limb here and say that season two is going to be absolutely incredible. Because in season two, I have a co-host. Co-host, say hello. Hello. That's Caroline. She's now my co-host. So season two of Shareable is going to be a little bit different. We're still talking about people and technology, but we're going to go a little bit deeper. A master class. So grab your favorite pen. And your favorite piece of paper. And get ready to take some notes because this is Shareable. Hello, hello, and welcome back to Shareable. My name is Jeff Gibbard, and I'm your host, and with me, as always, is my amazing, incredible, fabulous, and talented co-host, Caroline Oh, oh me? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> hair flip, hair flip. <laughs> uh, Hi, guys. As you all know, in season two of Shareable, if you've been listening, which of course you have, because why wouldn't you? It's such a good show. We are doing deep dives and going really into the masterclass space, bringing on experts in all different areas of life and business. And uh, today we have a real treat for you. Uh, But before we introduce our guest for today, I just want to also thank our Overcast listeners who have been such amazing support for us and kept us in the top 10 of the business category. We thank you so much. You are the bomb. And we appreciate when you click those little star buttons and keep us there so that more people can discover the amazing things that we are doing here on shareable with our very shareable episodes and speaking of amazing things who do we have on the show today uh amazing thing number one we have matt rosetta on the show matt say what up hey guys great to be here (laughs) thanks so much for being here today we had a little bit of connection problems getting our uh our thing working out today but now that you're here i want to jump right into today's show so the first thing i think we should do is have you introduce yourself for those of you who don't know who you are your uh list of credentials and your accolades and awards and the nice things that people say about you it's a lengthy (laughs) list so why don't you humble brag for a little bit and tell us how great you are <laughs> sure. So I'm uh, so I'm Matt Rosetta. I'm the founder and CEO of North Six Agency. Uh, short, or uh, we've come we've come to uh, be known as N6A through the years. Uh, N6A.com is our website. We are a PR and social media agency based here in New York City, with uh, with an office in Toronto. Uh, working with about uh, 60 clients across 30 different industries, doing all court, sorts of stuff for uh, their brand, help promote them externally to the world. And uh, about 51, 52 employees right now we're up to. That's pretty amazing. When did you say you started again? So I started out of, uh, out of my basement, Jeff, in uh, 2009. Um, I was about 26, 27 years old at the time. My wife was about eight months pregnant at home. We just quit a pretty cushy job and convinced her to uh, let me go out on my own without any stream of income and with, uh, with the baby on the way and uh, the whole, the whole you know, classic entrepreneurial story. So that's how this whole journey began. Damn, dude, you crazy. Why don't you keep going with it? Be like, and our house was on fire, and we had just sold our car, and I came down with black lung. I mean, like, why don't you just set the stakes a little bit more? Okay, so – It's just the Band-Aid approach, right? Just get it all, just, get it all off. Just keep getting it out of the way. So yeah. 2009, you're 26 years old. You got a wife who's pregnant, and you decide I'm going to start my own thing. So you start this agency, North Six. And um, you've had a, a pretty interesting ride so far. Can you give us the 30 seconds of between 2009 and all of that, uh, you know, heavy stuff that you were dealing with to now? Um, what are some of the things that have, have really come out of that? Yeah, well, you know, we started, we started, uh, when we started in 2009, it was just me, you know, bootstrapped out of my basement. Um, you know, at the time, really, I was, uh, I, I thought my dream back then was, just to work in my pajamas and work out of my house and service a few accounts and um, you know live the dream. That was that's what I thought it was. And then as I as I got our business started, I realized that that's not really what I wanted to do. Um, you know, a few months into it, uh, I missed the stimulation of being in an office environment and being around people. I really wanted to create something um, that was about more than just me. So that's when we really committed, or when I really committed. To um, you know, trying to trying to make a go out of it in terms of building a scalable business that brought others into um, you know, into the vision and into what we were building. And uh, from 2009, you know, we 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 never looked back. You know, we went to um, from my basement to a shared office space in Midtown Manhattan, uh, which one of our first clients was gracious enough to let us live in rent free for a few months to help us 
with overhead. Um, you know, we built our staff up to, you know, a handful of people and, you know, started to grow up a little bit and then moved into dedicated office space down in Tribeca here in New York City, one of those trendy neighborhoods. And, uh, you know, here we are now, seven, almost eight years later. Uh, we're on, I think it's our fourth office now. Um, you know, again, we have 50 some odd employees. We have two offices, New York and Toronto. We do a lot more than PR now. We do PR plus social. And it's, you know, it's, it's been a really awesome journey, um, Jeff. But uh, at the same time, you know, I really believe we're just starting to scratch the surface. And I, I think, um, you know, I think the best is yet to come. So I'm excited about what's 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 going on and what the future holds here. That's super exciting, man. So I think based on all the success and accolades that you've been able to accumulate in your illustrious career since 2009, you know, you went from a basement to two offices and 50 some odd employees. Today, what I'd like to do is talk to all of those people who are struggling entrepreneurs, they're early in their entrepreneurial journey, or maybe they're just still waiting mm -hmm. to get over that hump. And I want to pick apart some of the things that you've done in your career to grow from that basement to where you are today. And I want to look at a couple different aspects of it. Um, so today, if it's cool with you, I want to break down some of the things you and I had had a previous conversation before coming on, but you talked a little bit about some of the keys to your success, that there are a couple different things that you've done differently, things regarding the type of staff that you hired, how you treat them, all sorts of different things like that. Can you give us a high level of what you're going to talk to us about today? Yeah, sure. I think, uh, you know, certainly, um, you know, I, 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 I I'm not sure if I qualify as a millennial, you know, with my 35th birthday coming up soon here. But if I do, I'm just squeaking into that, you know, to that exclusive club. Um, so I did want to talk about, um, you know, recruiting a millennial centric culture that also revolves around customer service you know i think that's been a big uh you know one of our the, the, our, our big focal points in terms of something we've committed to as we've scaled through the years um you know how to build a winning culture i think there's a lot to be said about bringing uh, bringing empathy uh and personal values into the workplace so those are a few things uh, you know i'm certainly happy to talk about just from firsthand experience and trust me from a lot of uh lessons that i learned the hard way through the years excellent well i think that gives us plenty of which to play with so um let's start by kind of addressing the big elephant in the room. Uh, and that elephant mm. is the M word. It's these millennials. So there's a lot of people listening. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, I, if I go into another meeting where we talk about how we have to target millennials or how we're trying to recruit millennials or sell to millennials and how millennials aren't doing this or that or the other thing or the avocado toasts, um, <laughs> I'm going to scream. But uh, there are a lot of people that have a lot of thoughts about you know, these selfish entitled millennials that don't want to work hard and don't want to um, climb the ranks. What, what would you say in as someone who has built a team of millennials and has built a customer centric company culture with millennials? What's one of the big things that you think a lot of these um, companies and agencies that have had a hard time really corralling the millennials or understanding them? What's one of the things that they get wrong more than anything else? Well, I think the perception is wrong. I think, um, you know, everything that you said, which is spot on probably in terms of how millennials are perceived in the workforce, I think is dead wrong overall. And, you know, that, that I've learned uh, through a lot of uh, incredible relationships I've built with, you know, with our staff, um, you know, current past uh, staff members and, um, you know, people that we've met in our network of millennial, you know, clients as well uh, over the past seven, eight years. I think, I think, frankly, the millennial generation probably needs a PR agency, you know, so uh, because I think the perception is, is all wrong. Um, you know, I, I think when you're talking about man managing millennials in a workforce, uh, in, a, in a work culture, it certainly requires a lot more care and customization uh, and time, frankly, than maybe some of the past generations. But I don't think, um, you know, I, I, I think that the perception of, you know, self-entitled um, participation trophy holding millennial generation is, is, is dead wrong. And that's something that I've learned firsthand through the years. Caroline's smiling. My co-host <laughs> as our is resident millennial. millennial, as a card carrying yeah. millennial, she's she's so happy about what you're saying. Yeah, no, it's great. Yeah, I, Look, so, I'll, 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 yeah, go ahead. go ahead. No, I'll tell you. Like one thing, I mean, one thing I'll tell you about millennials, and this is something that I've learned again from firsthand experience. It's all about customization. There really is no one size fits all approach at all. And um, from a management perspective. 
you need to understand that, you know, millennial A versus millennial B versus millennial C, chances are have completely different um, love languages, right, in terms of what motivates them, in terms of how they want to be managed. And if you can just customize your approach uh, in a very personal way, show empathy and make sure that A, B, and C are being managed differently according to what's important to each of them, um, you know, you, you can actually, in my mind, you know, you're building building a really special culture with a level of diversity um, and, um, you know, and versatility that, that, that doesn't exist in a lot of places. So for me, millennial management, it might take a little bit longer, but it just comes down to customization and the end result is a lot more rewarding than, um, you know, the, 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 than anything. Yeah. I'm, you know, we're around the same age, you and I, and I'm wondering, um, you know, why wouldn't our parents' generation be really interested in that same sort of a thing? Like, why wouldn't you want to appeal to what's important to each individual person? And I think just the environment in which our parents grew up in, even the environment we grew up in, versus the environment that a lot of people that are, are younger than us in that 18 to 32 uh, range grew up in, where technology has made more options available to them and, and has made life look a little bit different. But I don't see why that would be even a bad approach to take, no matter who you are, is to just treat people people like people and figure out what motivates them and, and what I'm what seeing a theme emerging in these, these shareable episodes. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so let, let's kind of cut to you taking this decision of, so, so obviously you could have hired anybody, but I'm sure millennials are a much wider, uh, swath of people that you could hire at a, probably a lower cost, more trainable. There's a lot more, uh, millennials probably in the job market for what you're trying to do than uh, there were yes. seasoned 40 and 50 year old, uh, yeah. PR execs and everything. So, so you probably had a certain, like, it was probably obvious to go after hiring millennials, but you did something different and you kind of thought about the company culture and you tried to focus it around customer service. Let's, let's walk mm -hmm. through that. You know, how did you go about, did you kind of stumble into building this company culture or was this a well thought out plan from the beginning? Well, I knew when we set out to uh, to build N6A, Jeff, I knew that we wanted to create a unique and different culture. I, I knew we wanted to create a people-first culture. There were certain realities that existed that prevented us from uh, executing on some of my uh, ridiculously crazy ideas at the time, you know, things like budgets and, you know, cash flows, which, um, you know, not that they're not a concern anymore, but certainly back then I had big ideas, but we really couldn't execute on them because we had a lot of um, issues. You know, we also couldn't recruit. We didn't have a reputation, right? So, you know, you had to be crazy to come work for N6A in 2009, 2010, especially in that economy and join some completely unproven and unknown company. So those are no longer... Uh, you know, those obviously are no longer the case, and it's freed us up to um, actually execute on some ideas that, um, you know, that 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 I had. But but th but those ideas, you know, existed from day one when we started the business. It was just a matter of the realities of uh, our surroundings and our resources put us in a position where we couldn't necessarily execute on that seven eight years ago. So. How did you go about building this company culture around customer service? Like what were your steps that you took to do it? You know, so in the beginning, you obviously had more of an uphill battle of bringing in those people. But mm -hmm. somewhere along the way, something clicked for you where you realized that um, building this type of a company culture, maybe as you read a case study about Amazon or maybe you read a right. case study about something else, but something clicked for you. What was mm -hmm. kind of your first step in that journey towards building this type of a company culture? And take mm -hmm. us from that process through to kind of what things look like today for you guys. Sure. Well, I think there's two things that come to mind, Jeff. Number one is uh, you always want to think at, at least one step ahead in terms of where you're at in your business journey. And, uh, you know, I, I've made a lot of mistakes through the years. I think one thing that I will pat myself on the back for here is that I, I have always, um, you know, as we've grown our business, I think we've always thought um, about what's next, right? So wherever we're at today, we're already thinking about where we're going to be tomorrow. And I think when you're talking about scale and putting yourself in a position culturally where you can start to really do things, things that are different and unique and innovative, always having that forward, th forward thinking and forward looking one step ahead approach uh, is, is incredibly helpful, both from an internal culture and from a customer service culture perspective. Uh, number two, in, in a services business like ours, you know, we're a communications and social media agency, right? So from, you know, services business, you need to understand who is paying 
paying your bills, right? And your bills are being paid. And then who's who's helping you then uh, scale your business? And, you know, the financial ecosystem of services businesses are driven by two things. They're driven by uh, customers, by clients, and by employees. So, you know, you can't be, you know, can't be naive. You have to, you have to realize that your bills are being paid by customers and, you know, they're being retained by people who are on your payroll. So, so that goes back to this, with this culture of alignment between customers and employees. And, you know, you want your employees to be invested in the success of the customers and you want your customers to be invested in the success of the employees. And when you've created a culture where there's full alignment between those two, you know, you can really do some incredible things. So I, I think those are the two things I think about when, you know, you're talking about building a culture of customer services. Number one, always think one step ahead. And number two, create a culture of alignment between employees and your customers so that that one success, you know, one's success is the same as the others. Talk to me a little bit more about this alignment concept because I'm definitely into it and I, I want to go down that path so people can see it a little bit more clearly. You know, obviously it sounds great to have your customers align with your employee success. And it sounds great to have your employees who are rooting for the company and doing everything in the best interest while still understanding and aligning with what the customer is looking for. But how do you do that? And yeah. and I think specifically for the people listening right now, I'm sure what they want to know is how do you do that with a group of millennials? Because right. a lot of a lot of the people that listen to this show are a little bit later in their career and they're trying to figure out, you know, how do I connect with this person who has such a digital divide between my experience and theirs? How do I communicate with them and get them to align with the same values as mine? So if you could walk us through that process of one, how sure. did you create that alignment? Was it policy strategies, et cetera? And then how do you do it specifically when the audience audience you're trying to align are millennials? Well, the, well, the first part of the question is you, you want to create to, in order to create alignment, lay it all out there, like put it all out there, you know, lay it on the line, um, bring customers and their feedback directly to your staff and then reward your staff according to that. So I'll give you a good tangible example of what we do at N6A to, um, you know, sort of practice what we preach when it comes to alignment. Uh, every month we get a customer, we ask every one of our customers, you know, 60 some odd customers to rank us on a scale of one to six, you know, one is the worst, six is the best. Um, for N6A, we do everything in sixes here. Um, I was just going to ask you that. So thank you. <laughs> people are like, well, why don't you do one to 10? We, we do everything in sixes here. You learn that pretty quickly at N6A. Um, so, so every customer ranks us one to six. They can leave, they also leave feedback. You know, there's very, um, very objective KPIs that drive that one to six ranking that we had checkpoints that we've, um, that we've worked toward throughout over the course of the month to try to get, um, you know, a six, a perfect six on that scale. And then what we do is our internal, um, you know, our employees, all of the N6 Ayers, one of their KPIs themselves for individual performance, which determines things like like, um, you know, promotion expediency and opportunities to get, uh, um, you know, uh, more money and win competitions and bonuses and all that kind of good stuff. One of their KPIs is actually based on what the customers ranked us. So in that case, you know, if Jeff is a customer of ours uh, and it's the month of September and for the month of September, Jeff gave us a perfect six. Well, guess what? Whoever was servicing Jeff's account also benefits from that in their own individual KPIs. So now in that scenario, what you've done is you've created full alignment where, uh, you know, Jeff knows that the people he's ranking ultimately are going to be invested in his ranking and uh, the employees know whatever Jeff ranks us is going to be uh, you know, one of several factors that determine, uh, you know, our KPIs and our ability to grow within the company and do all kinds of really cool things. Um, so you've created a system where Jeff and the employee are married and they are completely, uh, you know, their success is intertwined. Um, so, th so that's, th that's one example. I would, th that's the larger point that that speaks to is just lay it all out there. Like transparency is key. And I've found through the years, you know, you can talk a good game about transparency. There was a time in my career where I, I think I was probably guilty of, you know, talking about how important transparency was, but I probably wasn't doing um, uh, as good a job as I could have been doing in terms of really practicing what we preached in terms of transparency. So do it. Like if you're a company, if you're a business owner, be transparent. Bring your com bring your customers into feedback processes, set up a system where your employees are rewarded according to that feedback. And, you know, there's really no ambiguity between the two. 
Talk to me a little about the early days before you had a team of 50 something in two offices where it was just you in the basement or maybe by the time you got to the dedicated desk, small team, you could probably easily identify anybody's feedback. And um, it, it's probably it's a little bit harder. You know, we're a small team. I, I think I'm, I'm listening to a lot of these and trying some of these ideas on. I'm thinking in a smaller team, it feels like it would be a little bit more difficult than it is in a larger team where you have bigger data sets. Um, and, and also sometimes in terms of the delivery, when you're dealing with a smaller team, I'm sure you, you realize that your team has a better ability to deliver for your clients, even from just an account management and communication standpoint by way of having more people. How did you deal with this sort of thing and go from that small team where this was more difficult to a team now where this has a much bigger impact? Well, the, a lot of them is, it's a great point because, because a lot of the mistakes I feel I've made, uh, in, you know, in my career, uh, as a business leader, probably were during those very early days where we were a lot smaller and there was there was a, a, a disparate and a siloed nature to the example I just gave you of transparency, right? Where, uh, you know, now I'll, let's go back to the example we just talked about. You know, Jeff is a customer of ours um, and Matt is servicing Jeff's account and we're four or five people and, you know, I'm one of two or three people on Jeff's account in this scenario. Matt's KPIs would not necessarily be uh, tied to uh, Jeff's customer satisfaction, right? And that was a big mistake I made, and I made that back in the early days when we were only four or five people. Where Matt could think he's doing a great job, Matt could think he's doing a great job because you know he thinks he's knocking out of the park for Jeff. But then when you know when it comes to the end of the month, you know I get a pink slip from Jeff saying, "Hey, you know you're gone because I wasn't happy," and I, I realized that there wasn't really an effective system of alignment between Jeff's satisfaction and Matt's and Matt's um, KPIs. So. You know, that's actually a, a lesson that I learned during the early days. So, you know, what we did was we just started to make some tweaks to that process way back in those early days. And we, we just started to get a lot smarter about that. If Matt is going to get promoted eight times at N6A and, you know, if he's going to be making X amount more in terms of um, – you know, compensation and if he's going to win all these incredible trips and uh, rewards, well, he better be doing that because Jeff is happy and he's servicing Jeff's account and Jeff's a happy customer. So, you know, we sort of learned that in the early days. And as we've scaled, we just sort of scaled that system where, um, you know, it's created a larger data set, but it's also created a little bit more complexity in terms of there's more KPIs as the org chart has scaled. The KPI structure has become a lot more sophisticated and there's a lot more levels involved. So you would think that as you scale, it becomes a lot easier to implement this sort of transparent Jeff to Matt customer service um, KPI system. But there's also a lot of complexities involved because the org chart becomes a lot more complex and there's new positions that are created along the way. Um, but that's something we learned in the early days. I, I think the advantage that I would tell your listeners who are in the early days right now, the advantage they have is that they can be very nimble and they can react. And as long as they, uh, as long as they're smart about it, you can make very, you can make corrections very easy to very easily to that system when you're four or five people and you can really set your infrastructure up to scale, you know, at 52, 53 people, um, thank God we have a really solid infrastructure in place that has set us up to scale to the next level. But, um, you know, but that all started back when we were four or five people. I don't think we would be able to make the same adjustments today that we were able to make when we were just a handful of folks. In building this customer service based organization, and you've got, and, and we'll address the millennial thing in a second, but just more about your process of creating alignment and everything. Yep. How how flexible is the system that you've put together to, I guess, what I would just call curveballs, right? So mm. if 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 Caroline's compensation is tied to how happy Jeff is as a customer, and there's some sort of an act of God that she can't uh, possibly predict, a market change, a this, a that, the other mm. thing, and it causes the client to be very upset, and they're consequently upset with Caroline, how much does that impact her? First thing. Second thing, mm. um, what about just clients that are just jerks? You know, like we, if you're in the service business, you know that like, yeah, we love all of our clients, but sometimes you get people that are just jerks and they're just not happy. How do you keep employees aligned and happy when sometimes there are things that are outside of their control to, mm. to stay in that customer service mindset? Yeah. I mean, that's the million dollar question. It comes down to culture, creating a culture of trust. Um, you need data is great, right? Data is fantastic. And it ultimately is the lifeblood of 
uh, you know, of a services business, no question about it. However, if you're just looking at data without any level of subjectivity, right, and discretion, you're doing something wrong. So, you know, in the scenarios you gave, you need to be thinking about things from the perspective of having empathy, using common sense. And if you can't trust senior management at an organization to do things like that when there are exceptions that come up and when there's a pain in the butt client or when there's a completely unreasonable um, customer service rating, you know, then chances are you're in the wrong place to begin with. So, um, you know, there always has to be a level of discretion used and you need to trust, you you need to trust that you're in good hands at the company that you're working with or working for. And if you're not, you should leave because the culture is not right for you. And there's some, Along the way, there was some sort of breach of trust where, you know, you're not trusting the system, you're not trusting the process, and you know that probably means that, you know, there's there there's a better there's a better place for you to be than the place you're working at right now. Yeah, that all makes perfect sense. I I want to talk to you a little bit about the challenges with millennials, but there's something that I I just want to make sure that I ask it because I want to I, I'm sure somebody listening is thinking the same thing. Yeah, and that is why. So the, the why is why build why build a company culture around customer service? Why do all of this uh, data mining to find out if the client is happy, this and that? Is, is it worth the investment of time and energy and money to do all of this? Or can you just get by by doing like a good enough job and, and scale your company by cutting corners here and there and or or even just you know not doing these things? Like what what to you is the proof in the pudding that this method of doing agency work with this sort of a mindset, what's the proof in the pudding to you that this is the way to do it? Well, the, the, the final chapter has yet to be written. So, you know, we're making a really big bet on our model being the right one here at N6A, Jeff, but there's no guarantee, right? You know, I think that over the course of eight years, we've done some really incredible things. I'm incredibly proud of, uh, the people we've surrounded ourselves with and the culture that we built and, you know, the build, the vision that we continue to build toward. But there's no guarantee that, you know, in the end, we're going to have the last laugh. I believe we are, but there's no guarantee. And I, and I do think that as a business owner or as a business leader, you need to be, you know, you need, you need to be aware of that. You need to be aware of, you need incredible conviction uh, in, in the vision, right? And in the journey that you have um, chosen to go on. Um, however, you also need to be very secure in knowing that there's no guarantee, right? It could, it, you know, you think you get the thing right and you think uh, when all is said and done, you're going to have the last laugh and you're going to be, you know, you're going to be uh, crossing the finish line first, but that's not a guarantee. So um, I, I can't sit here in good conscience and tell you today in 2017 that in 2037, uh, you know, we're going to be seen as the kingpin and the number one leader in our category. But I can tell you that, um, you know, we're going to work our butt off and we're going to continue to do things um, innovatively and with the level of experimentation that got us here. And, um, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll see where it goes. All right. Fair point. Fair point. So talk to us a little bit about the challenges of working with millennials. So far, you know, you've, you've painted a pretty awesome picture of building a company culture that you've, you've found systems to create alignment between, between uh, how the customer is feeling about things and how your employees are working and the incentive structures for them. Um, you, you know, you've painted kind of a rosy picture and, and not to say that you've painted it an, an untruthful <laughs> picture. I'm not, not, yeah. not saying that, but just more, one of the things I think um, a lot of people listening, you know, they struggle with the millennial question and, mm-hmm. and there are obviously challenges and things that make them different uh, as a generation than the older generation. What are some of the things that even you as sort of on just the tip of the millennial iceberg, what are some things that you as a leader run into that are challenges with millennials? Well, the number one thing you need to, you need to look yourself in the mirror and either commit or not commit, right, to building a culture um, of, of you know of, of top notch millennial talent and innovation. You need to make that commitment from day one, and I say that, and I say that like not in an egomaniacal way at all. I just say that because it's incredibly hard. Like it comes at and it comes at an incredibly steep price. I mean, I can't tell you how many sleepless nights I've had, and you know how much hair loss I've suffered. Um, but it all traces. It's roots back to those early days when 
I made a decision that our business was going to be about more than just one person. It was going to be about more than just me, and there was going to be people involved, and there was going to be a journey. And whenever you know, whenever my you know, whenever the going gets tough, right? I I, I think back to those days, and this is what. I signed up for, and I think that business leaders need to ask themselves that same question from day one, and then reflect back on that question because it does come at an incredibly, an incredibly steep price, especially with millennials. You know, our, our, you know, eighty percent of, seventy percent or so of our staff, you know, are m- millennials, and it's incredibly rewarding. Like the, the, the end result is incredibly, uh, you know, it's incredibly rewarding. It has been in a phenomenal ride, but it's come at an incredibly steep price. And I, I, I think you need to look at yourself in the mirror. You need to be really honest with yourself and say, am I willing to pay this price to build the culture that I want to build with millennials at the core? Because there's nothing wrong with no being with, if the answer to that question is no, there's nothing wrong with it. It just changes the strategy up. So are you talking mainly about the price being like the humility and the openness to actually venture down this path? Or are you talking more the the actual costs of kind of the ups and downs and different things that, that you go through in building a culture like this? Well, it's much more of an emotion, much more of an emotional cost than a finance. I mean, there's obviously financial costs involved here, but it's much more, look, it comes at, it takes a toll, right? It, it, there's an incredible amount of you need to be incredibly comfortable making adjustments, thinking on the fly, learning on the go, tweaking your business model and your culture, you know, culture uh, according to feedback you're getting almost in real time, like at frenetic, uh, you know, real time rapid response rates. That, 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 and and th- that's the reality of what it takes to build a top notch culture with millennials at the center. Um, and you know, there, there's not everybody um, is willing to do it. Not everyone wants to do that. And you just need to be really honest with yourself, I think, at the beginning of your business journey and say, look, uh, the, you know, whatever whatever you think from day one, the the emotional toll that it's going to take on you is whatever you think that's going to be, multiply that by a thousand and then say, am I willing to pay that price? And if the answer is yes, it's going to be a lot of fun. Because you know you've already answered the question and you've committed to paying an incredibly steep price. If the answer is no, it's fine. You know you just start to make decisions differently. And uh, I would just want to jump in and say a lot of that thinking on the go and and recreating your business on the fly that's coming from that customization that that working with your staff of millennials would would entail, and that's part of the the risk I suppose you're talking about. Yeah, like I'll give you guys a great example. When I started, yeah, that's absolutely right. When you know, when I started our business, again, I told you guys that my vision from day one was just to was just to work out of my pajamas in my basement, you know, service a few accounts, and I, you know, I thought that was, you know, maybe hire two or three employees, and you know, I was good to go. I thought that's what I really wanted to do, and then I found out that that wasn't what I wanted to do. I wanted to build something bigger. And, you know, part of there was a larger journey and vision that I was trying to, um, you know, trying to build out. Um, so fast forward now, a few years later, after I started our business, I, I hated working from home because I had worked from home. I done, I had done that. And me personally, it didn't, provide me with the stimulation or the energy that, um, that I really needed. Right. So I learned the hard way. I didn't want to work from home and I carried that with me as we, as we scaled our business. So our work from home policies, our work from home practices and, and, uh, philosophy was, you know, wasn't incredibly friendly, for example, if I was going to be brutally honest with you, you know, three or four years into our business. And that was, that was just a result of me personally, not being a big work from home guy, uh, but you. But then I learned real quickly that that wasn't necessarily shared by uh, a lot of our, our our employees, who at the time were almost exclusively, uh, you know, in the millennial demographic. They wanted flexibility to work from home. They wanted the ability to um, you know manage their work ba- you know work life balance with uh, freedom, and you know work from home was a big part of that. So. You know, at first I was a little bit stubborn and wouldn't do it, wouldn't do it. And then you learn real quickly, though, what's important to your staff, and you have to make a decision as a business leader. All right, like, are, are you going to be too stubborn for your own good, or are you going to adjust your philosophies because this is what your staff is telling you? So that was a good example of a pivot that I had to make pretty quickly. Um, and you know, from that point forward, you know, we've been incredibly friendly when it comes to work from home. In fact, we have an unlimited work from home policy 
there's the performance element tied to it, but it's an unlimited work from home policy. And that's the direct result of, you know, just listening to your people, being very open and honest, looking yourself in the mirror and adjusting your practices accordingly. And you've seen the productivity change based on who, who worked really well in that environment too? Yeah, because what we'll do is what we'll do at N6A is we'll always for the, our whole business philosophy is based on building a culture where you get out of the company what you put in. You know, it's a very mm-hmm. merit based system. So in the work from home, in the work in the example of the work the unlimited work from home, the message to the staff is really simple. If work from home is important to you, take it. Take every day of the calendar year as long as there's not a client in the office and work from home. You know, that that's the message. Work from home. You can work from you know your couch, you can work from your bedroom, you can work from you know, Timbuktu for all, for all we care. <laughs> um, but what we ask back is you just achieve a minimum uh, performance ranking, right, in that KPI system. And as long as you achieve the minimum performance ranking and it doesn't dip below a certain mark in, in any given month, you, you retain that unlimited work from home right. And that's kind of the give, right? There's the give and there's the take. The give is unlimited work from home. The take is just make sure your performance is not dropping as a result of working from home. And, you know, we're good. And I I think that creating that culture of, you know, giving what, you know, giving and taking, you know, equally, I think is really important. Yeah. Speaking from example, I know that like having the ability to work for Jeff and for us to be able to talk about like our different concerns is a freeing concept that a lot of my other friends don't enjoy with their employers. And they always keep me, keep me humble and remind me how valuable that actually is and that it's not something you get in every workplace. So I know that that's appreciated. Yeah. And that's another great example. Like we, we have all these very unique and innovative uh, competition programs. You know, we've sent our top performers to incredible, incredibly, you know, luxurious places across the world, like Bali and Paris and the Amalfi Coast and all these great trips, right? Um, and that, to me, was always how I envisioned an amazing, you know, that that's always a perk that I envisioned an amazing company giving. Like that, So we kind of created those perks based on the fact that that's something I thought was it would be important to me if I were putting myself in the shoes of 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 our employees, right? Um, and granted, our employees you know love that stuff. So I'm not trying to downplay, you know, the value or how unique any of those programs are. But but what you learn about in time is that you you get really smart about those things and you solicit feedback. You know, you're very transparent about collecting feedback from people and being very open about asking what's important to them. And then you make tweaks. So while those you know, trips and vacations are still very much a fabric of our culture. There's other stuff that's involved now that I probably wouldn't have thought of had I not, you know, had we not approached our staff and been very open about asking them what, what's important. And like that, and, and their feedback has directly impacted stuff that is in our, is a part of our perks and our cultural program right now that didn't exist four or five years ago and probably never would have if we didn't get smart about soliciting the feedback. Yeah, it's kind of like you built the company you wanted to work for, which is very much the approach that I have been taking about my company is you build the company you want to work for. But as you continue to build it, you build it with the feedback from everybody that's part of the company. So it starts out as one thing and it begins to take on the life of the company of the the company you keep, so to speak. Well, totally. Well, Jeff, I mean, that's, you know, it's 100 percent true. Um, And because what you find out, too, is that once you scale to a certain point, you find out that especially in the services business, it's really about more than just you. Like if you want to get to that next level, guess what? Like you're not, you're not that smart. You know, you're going to, you're only, <laughs> you need a lot smarter people around you to get you to that next level. And, um, you know, in order to do that, you really need to show empathy. You need to, you need to be open to feedback. You need to make adjustments according to what is really important to your people and not just yourself. And, and that's really how you get to the next level. Yeah, absolutely. So I want to ask you this. I want to kind of wrap this whole thing by bringing it back to the beginning. So mm-hmm. we've talked a lot about the reasons that you would do this, the things that you're challenged by in in building a company culture with millennials that is focused on customer service, a lot of the metrics and things that you focused on. Um, but I want to take it back to the beginning. And yep. I want you to start from scratch. I want you to pretend right now that North Six doesn't exist and you're mm-hmm. starting a completely brand new agency, brand new entity. And this is for, you know, the, the reason for this is I want you to, to take any of the people listening right now on a journey from start to finish. You're yeah. starting from scratch. Who are the, you know, you've got maybe 
couple thousand dollars to your name to start this thing. Maybe you have $10,000 in the bank or something. What's the process you go through in building this company? What are the things you think about? Who are the first few people you hire? Forget about the money aspect for a second. Just start thinking about how do you go about building this, the systems, the processes, the people. Can you give us just, if you could, the the highest level version, step-by-step step of how you go about building a company like yours? The first thing I would do in hindsight, I would build a company with – and you, you, you hit on a bunch of stuff there. When it comes to what kind of people you're surrounding yourself with, don't look at paper. Don't look at resumes, and I mean this. Um, eventually, you're, you're going to have to look at paper. You're going to have to look at experience. You're going to have to look at resumes, but when you're first starting out, the, literally the fir- you know that inner circle of people that you're just starting to build around the company should be uh, – you should have a culture first – mindset toward bringing them on to the journey with with you, right? So uh, if that means that, you know, if that means that Jeff has no PR experience, if Jeff has no social media experience, but I communicate very clearly to Jeff what I what I want our vision to be, how we're going to be different from other agencies, and Jeff culturally shares those same philosophies, I want Jeff on my team, right? And that's a mistake I think I might have made way, way, way back in the early days where I think I looked at paper and I looked at experience and I thought about, um, you know, I thought about sizzle, you know, I thought about which type of people we surround ourselves with and what the perception would be in the open market just based on, just based on their track record and their resume. I think in retrospect, I wouldn't look at it that way. I would just look at people who share the same values and who are equally as motivated and driven to be on the journey as I am. And I would probably take a very similar approach externally to how we you know, how you would recruit uh, your first batch of customers. Your first batch of customers, you know, when you're starting out in your basement, they, they either have to be cheap or they have to be crazy because they're either cheap because they, they're, they're, they're either paying you a nickel on the dollar, you know, because you're offering them a service uh, that, uh, you know, that, that, that others just can't match from a pricing perspective, or they have to be a little bit crazy. Like they got to be a little bit willing, you know, they have to be a little, they have to be willing to roll the dice and to take a, to take a risk with hiring you because there's so many other service providers that are, um, you know, that are just as capable that have a much better track record. So, you know, think about recruiting customers with that same mindset. Obviously you don't want cheap customers. So look for crazy customers, look for customers who you, who will buy into the vision, you know, be very open with them about, Hey, this is what we're trying to build. Uh, you know, we need a customer that's going to be a flagship customer. That's going to help us get, you know, be the, the building block, the first building block toward this vision that we're looking to execute on. Do you, are you crazy enough to come on this journey with us? And I think when you match internal employee and your first batch of external customers and they're both sort of crazy enough to join the journey together you know th- that to me would be that to me would be the foundation I would look to build from if I had to do this all over again wow that is so like <laughs> that's your one two punch that's pretty kick ass I man start with the culture first mindset find people crazy enough to come along on the journey on the inside and they go outside and find some people that are crazy enough to come along on the journey and let you service them as a as an agency yeah and and for the record I mean I've been very blessed and fortunate in, in my career and in my business journey where I've had a lot of crazy people, I guess you could say, around me. I mean, my inner circle, you know, my inner circle uh, believed in me, both customers and employees believed in me and believed in what we were building. And, you know, I guess I was always very fortunate to do that. But I did make a lot of mistakes, I think, out of the gate where once I got past that inner circle, I think I recruited internally and externally without that culture first mindset. And in hindsight, it was probably a mistake. Wow. All right, man. Well, uh, I think this has been an incredible journey from start to finish of how to build a company that's company that's, you know, uh, customer service centric, uh, takes into account building a team full of millennials and how to go about doing that. So (laughs) hopefully everybody that's listening has learned a lot from that. But uh, Matt, you have graciously set aside some time for us. I know we got a little bit of a late start today and you've got to run, but I would like to give you a little bit of a chance to tell people who you are and what, you know, really what you're about and where you, where they can get involved with you specifically. So this is your time to kind of humble brag, talk a little bit about what you've done in your career. It's also a place to tell people where, how they can get involved with you and how they can hire you, or they can just have a chat with you or follow you socially or whatever. This time is yours basically, uh, as our, you know, thank you for setting aside the time and, uh, and coming to talk to us. Thanks, Jeff. I appreciate that. Caroline as well. Um, also, I must say for, you know, the focal point of, for the focal point of this segment being on, uh, you know, millennial recruitment in a way, 
you're talking to somebody who didn't even know how to connect on Skype and we had to do this on the landline. So <laughs> yeah, I don't know how, I don't know how connected to my own audience I am. I, I don't know. Little... I mean, I feel like I would have spoken up more if I disagreed with anything. I, I really <laughs> feel like you hit all the points that I was in agreement with. She really would have. She, she is not, she does not we're, hold back. We're going to do the next, we're going to do our next set of communications via fax machine. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> um, but no, look, uh, you know, uh, so First off, um, go to n6a.com or competeandcare.com, which is our recruiting portal. It goes over all of our cool perks and programs and um, you know incentive competitions and all that sort of cool stuff about N6A's culture. Uh, you know, from a recruiting standpoint, we're just always looking to recruit the best of the best at every level. You know, we obviously kept the the theme of this conversation focused on millennials, but, you know, we have incredible talent at N6A at all levels, you know, uh, junior staff, mid-level management, senior level, you know, older people like me, obviously, who have graduated beyond the millennial demo at this point. So, um, you know, definitely, you know, check us out on N6A.com, go to competeandcare.com, um, get in touch. We're always looking for, we call them net positives here, Caroline and Jeff. Um, <laughs> <laughs> which are at the at the state at the scale that we're at, you know, fifty two people, and we're trying to get to that next level now. Um, you know, uh, good a, a good friend of mine who's also you know somebody who I trust through the years. Uh, you know, through, and I've, I've gotten to know him really well. His name is Brian Buckwald. Uh, was a client of ours. Told me he's like Matt at the stage at the scale that you're at. Don't hire anybody unless they're a net positive. And what he meant by that was are they making your company better right at every step of at every step of the way right no matter if they're an entry level uh employee who's going to be you know filing papers or you know working in the IT room or whatever or are they you know part of the senior management team that's going to be making really important decisions in the boardroom it's like make sure they're a net positive they need to make the company and the culture better um if it's a net negative if they're making you worse obviously dead on arrival don't even look at them if it's a net neutral if it's someone who's really good on paper but they're not really making the company better don't look at them it's you really only want net positive so if you're a net positive if you can make N6A better, we want you and you should get in touch with us. And there's a lot of ways you can make us better, not just from a talent or a performance perspective, but, you know, when you're in net positive, you can make us better by, you know, through your work ethic or through your sense of humor, maybe, or through uh, learning, you know, knowing a language that maybe some of us don't know and you can make us better that way. So we're kind of always thinking about how we can improve our company by hiring people that are making us better, you know, even if they come in unconventional ways. That's awesome, man. Well, for all of you out there that are listening, I hope you go and check that out, especially if you are in the New York area or, you know, there's a, there's a generous work from home policy. So I, I think yeah. you could even yeah. be also, anywhere. Also, apparently they're very interested in millennials. So. Uh, apparently. So if you are a millennial <laughs> yeah. or really anybody that's super talented, definitely uh, – Check it out. Uh, go to n6a.com and we'll put that in the show notes as well, as well as all the other things that we've talked about. We'll put those in the show notes. Thank you, Caroline. <laughs> um, so I guess that just about wraps it up. Uh, millennials, they're more than just avocado toast fans. Who knew? <laughs> uh, so for all of you out there listening, thanks so much for listening to Shareable. I have been Jeff Gibbard. I am here with my co-host, Caroline. I, I was Caroline. So. You were the whole time. And Matt, and on his end, was Matt Rosetta the whole time. So, I wonder uh, who we're going to be next time. Yeah, I guess <laughs> we'll just too. keep being the same people. So thank you so much for tuning in. Come back next time. We're going to keep doing these right. deep dives until the end of season two, and we love you all. Matt, thanks so much for coming on. This episode was Shareable. Damn right. There are a few thank yous and shout outs in order. First, I'd like to thank Ray Bueno for all of that sexy production value and a quick thank you to me for producing the show. I'd like to send a shout out to DJ Quads for the use of our theme song, Always, and A. Himitsu for the use of our outro song, Adventures. You can follow Jeff on Twitter at Jay Gibbard and you can follow me at Caroline Stone. You can follow the show at shareable underscore pod and just at shareable podcast on everything else. That means Facebook, Instagram, everything. You can email us at sharablepodcast at gmail.com or subscribe to our email list at sharablepodcast.com slash subscribe. Do all the things. Subscribe to the show. Leave us a rating. Review us on iTunes. Tell a friend. Tell your mom. I don't know. She might like it. 